Hello, my friends. Professor Benavides here. Let's talk about chapter nine classes, the tail end of this chapter. Finally, we're going to be talking about three things. Number one, the Python standard library. We'll also go over some of the try it yourselves. We'll talk about styling classes, and then we'll have the chapter nine summary. Um, so what is the Python standard library? The Python standard library is a set of modules included with every Python installation. Now you have a basic understanding of how functions and classes work. You can start to use modules like these that other programmers have written. So the idea is this. You know how functions work. You know how classes work. Many times that's referred to as programmer defined functions. It's not the way it's def defined in the book, but that's the way I learned it. There's also a whole bunch of other functions and classes that are defined by the language. So these, these are, are you know, defined by the language you know, uh, or for that matter, to use modules like these that other programmers have written, and they put them in the Python standard library, and there's tons of them. What you really should have is a little introduction on uh, on what the standard, what what the Python standard library is, and how you can navigate it and find the different uh, you know parts of it. Advanced programmers will probably spend a lot of time there. To use any of the functions or any function or class in the standard library, you're going to have to include a simple import statement at the top of your file. Let's look at uh, one module in particular, the random module, which can be useful in modeling many real world situations. Now, your book uses the Python interpreter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use both of them and um, going to go ahead and experiment a little bit with this. I'm going to use the Python interpreter first, and then I'm going to go ahead and, and use the um, use Sublime and uh, type in the code there, because uh, um, I think it's good to contrast that. So let me go ahead and type in CMD. And here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to type in Python. And let me go ahead and make this window a little bit bigger so we can see a little bit better. OK, now I'm going to go ahead. Uh, the first thing we want to do is that import statement. I'm going to import it two different ways. And you know, we learned about the dot operator. So let's just go ahead and use it. I like to just say import and then random. OK, so now that I've got that done, do you think I can just go ahead and say uh, we're going to use the random int method? To generate a random number, do you think I can just go ahead and type in ran int from one to six, including six? What's going to happen if I press enter here? It's not going to work. So how can I make it work? I'm going to press the up arrow here, come to the very beginning, and type in random. Remember, we just finished learning about using the dot operator. So it knows to. Um, uh, it's kind of like a path. I don't even really think of it that way. It's, it's a way of getting to that particular function. So I press enter and it works. I generate that random number. If I want to uh, issue that again, just press the up arrow key and boom, I've got another random number. Now, if I didn't want to have to type in the dot operator, I can go ahead and say from random space import random or rand int, excuse me. Then I can go ahead and issue this command here without having to use the dot notation. See? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and do one more little example. And I'm going to uh, make this blatantly repetitive. Uh, let me go ahead and, and uh, create a, a small list of players. It doesn't have to be the same players that are in the book, but um, you know, we can go ahead and create our own little list.
All right, so there's my list. And um, we're going to use the choice function uh, on here. So let's go ahead and use it without the dot operator, right? You know, in other words, it can't find it. If you, you know, you, you can't find it. So let's say first up, gets choice, and then I'm going to pass it players. So it says it can't find it, right? So how how do I I make this work? You know, uh, you know why can't it it find it? In order to go ahead and find it, I've got to go ahead and say random dot choice, right? And after I do that, then I can go ahead and see what's inside of there. You know, you don't have to type in the print statement it's just to show what's inside of something, you know? And boom, Carol is in there. Issue that again, Carol. First up, uh, it's Carol, 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 because I only ran um, the choice one time. And, and otherwise, I'd have to go ahead and, and run this one more time. And then I would go ahead and um, see that there's, well, there should have been a different one in there. You know, let's go ahead and, and try that again. Um, I've got, I'm going to go ahead and issue this command on here, which is what choice does is it picks a, a something at random from a list. Okay, so when I when I run this, it gets something at random and it puts it in first up. And then I want to see what's in first up and it says Ted. I thought it was a worker because it gave me Carol uh, twice and I thought, but it is random. So it's not, it can repeat. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to see later on different ways in which, um, you know, we can make it so that it doesn't repeat with a with a, a, an if statement. Okay. So uh, how can I go ahead and just use choice without having to use the dot operator? I can go ahead and say from random import choice. Then I can go ahead and uh, not have to type in random. And let's test that out. So then let's go ahead. See, I didn't get an error message, right? And it's got 10. I guess you uh, do that again. And it's got 10 again. What? But it could have been repetitive again. So let's, let's test this out again. So if I go choice to uh, 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 to first up, and then just say first up, head again. Oh, there. I mean, that's a little spooky that it would it, it would give me the same thing again. So let me just go ahead and try it again. So as you can see here, I'm going to issue this out first underscore up. It's going to pick from the players. The players are Bob, Carol, Ted, and Alice. Okay, I know it can, you know, there's only four of them, probably should have put more on them. And then I'm going to go ahead and see what, what's inside of first up. And it's got Carol. Okay, so it's only four of them. So and I just wanted to like, this is what you call it, maybe over testing, right? But it is generating them at random. Now, um, you know, like I say, some people really like the CMD. You could really test out a lot of ideas fast that way. But let's go ahead and just bring this idea into Sublime, okay? Or let's just go ahead and do uh, Visual Studio Code. Okay, so what I'm doing here is on line one and two, I have import statements like the ones I just talked about here. And I know I shouldn't have used, shouldn't use X, so let me go ahead and, and say huh. Ran, how's this? And you shouldn't abbreviate either, so, but it's Nike for me. Okay. It looks a little bit better, right? If I can spell correctly, R A N D. Still not used to this new keyboard. All right, so I'm going to generate. Uh, uh, first, I'll have uh, an import statement to to import ran int. That is the function that generates a random integer. And then I'm going to I'm going to import choice so that I can use the choice function to choose um, 
one of the elements from a list. So when I run this, it's going to print the random number and it's going to print um, one of the uh, players from that list. So let me go ahead and run this. Well, that's not what I want it to do. So I thought it was in Sublime again. So let's run this again. So it, it says five and Michael. Let me run it again one more time. So now it says four and Ellie. You know, one and Ellie. Right, that's good. You know, first print first up. Why not print first up? I'm going to do the title, right? So Charles, I think it looks better with a, you know, I know that the book didn't do it that way because we're, we're really just zeroing in on using the choice function, you know, and um, there's, See, one of the ways you can learn about the choice, but there's so many different ways of doing this. You could go to the online documentation uh, and, or you could just float around on CMD and, and, and learn it that way. It doesn't, it's not covered in your book. You know, ah, I was going to, I was going to detour on it, but I've got a lot of things to cover, so I won't go there. Uh, so that's the demos in Sublime. So uh, again, we're, I'm demonstrating a ran, a, 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 the ran int uh, function. This function takes two integer arguments and returns a randomly selected integer between and including those numbers. The other one, the other function was choice. This function takes in a list or a tuple and returns a randomly chosen element. So the random module um, shouldn't be used for building security related application, but it's good enough for many uh, fun and interesting projects. What they're trying to say is that this random module, it's not good enough for professionals, for security related things. It's what you would, what some people refer to as pseudo random. But you know, when you see the, uh, you see what the effects of this function can do. I mean, it's as, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's just that there's some standards that need to be met in order for it to be used in security related applications. So you could download uh, modules from external sources and uh, you'll see a number of these examples in the part two of your book uh, where we'll need some external modules to complete the project. Okay, if you wanna know more about the random function, um, I, would, I would recommend that you go to the author's website. In fact, let me just go ahead and show you. Um, if you go to my lecture notes, I have the link there. If you um, go to the author's website, he's got a lot of cool information on the random, um, you know, random functions. So the first thing he does is he says, hey, you can go to the documentation. Well, the, the bad part about this is that it's not very understandable to beginners. So if you click on this, he takes you right to the uh, online documentation. Uh, on here, and it talks about how random generates a uh, generates a pseudo random numbers, and it goes through. A, uh, there's quite a few of them on here, so definitely, if you're feeling in a very nerdy kind of mood, you can go ahead and do that. I would probably, um, I mean, you know, uh, drill down on generating a random number between zero and one. Uh, gener we covered the random int, so let's go ahead and look at that. And he goes uh, another example, very similar to what we just did, random int. I called it random or rand num. Uh, and then he gives another little example uh, down here of using the, the choice function. So you can see there's a lot of cool information. Um, this is in the section called Beyond Python Crash Course, that's PCC. If you click on that, you'll be able to drill down on many things that are not in your book. I just drilled down on the random functions, but there's a lot of extra stuff on here uh, that, can, um, that can be used to, you know, to, to kill your time, right? To kill time, uh, no, no. To learn more about Python and the, uh, the library, right? So hopefully that was an entertaining kind of uh, uh, detour. So let's go ahead and take a look at the try it yourselves. Let's look at 913, first of all. So 913 says make a class die with one attribute called slides. 
which has a default value of six, uh, write a method called roll die that prints around the number between one and the number of sides of the die, the, the, or that the die has. Make a six-sided die and roll it 10 times. Make a 10-sided die and roll it 20 times. So roll each die 10 times is the idea, right? So let's just take a quick look at this uh, idea here. And I've already put in a breakpoint, but before I do that, let me just clap. We've got the die class, and that's really the only class on here that we're going to be using. So in the die class, well, at the very top, we import um, rand int from random, okay, from the random module. And we, do, we create a class called die. And in die, we, we put in two little methods. The init method, which uh, has a default value of six for side, and the roll die method, which returns a random int between one and six. Then we go ahead and in the main logic for the program, we create a list, an empty list, and we loop through that list 10 times, right? And what we do is we generate an object, or we, we go ahead and we, we already generated the object of 15, excuse me. We use that object to access the roll die method, and we, we put the result in result, and then we, re, we append that result to results. So results is the list. So as we're doing this, we're generating a random number and we're adding it to the list. So this is gonna happen 10 times, right? So, so it's gonna go from zero to nine, right? Um, then we go ahead and um, make a 10-sided die. So we pass 10, so it's no longer gonna be six. The default is six. We're gonna pass 10 and our object is called D10, and we go through this again and iterate through it. It's the same structure. And then we go ahead and instantiate another object off of this class. We pass 20, call the object D20. And if you notice, each time we're doing this, we're, we're re-declaring um, results. So it starts from scratch again. I mean, you could have called this, you know, results one, results two, results three, but why create so many different lists? We're just reusing it. And every time we say results gets the, and every time we create an empty list, everything that was in there from before is gone and we create an empty list. Now, I'm only gonna go through the first part of uh, on here so that we can see the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and do the, uh, the step into uh, on this. So I'm gonna go to run, start debugging and Python file. All right, so I'm going to want to go ahead and open this up so we can see what's in here. So line, it stops on line 15 because that's where I put the breakpoint, and that's where we're going to go ahead and instantiate or create an instance of the die class. As you can see, that the the, uh, the the class die is defined on line three. So I'm gonna press uh, F11, or I can go ahead and just click on this little step into button. Either one works out. So uh, the, the first thing that happens uh, in creating an instance is it goes into the class and it sets the sides to six. So it's got an attribute being set to six. Then it comes back to the place from which it was called and goes to the next line. It creates an empty list called results. Then we're going to go and iterate through this. We're going to iterate through this 10 times, right? So as we go through this, step into, we're going to go ahead and call, uh, uh, call the roll die method and put it in results. And it goes back up to the class. It rolls the die, generates the random number, right? It's a default of six. And the reason why I like this over here is that you can see what's, uh, you know, what was what was in there and, and, and what's happening. If I, and if you point to this, you can see what's uh, 
what it has on here. So let's go ahead and, and do the step into again. So it's got six in there, right? Or three, excuse me. <laughs> so you see how I'm, if I point to result, it shows a three. Also over here, it shows three in my variables list. It's going to go ahead and append that. And it's going to go ahead and do this again. It's going to roll, it's going to go ahead and go through this and generate another number. See how it generates another number here? And it's then go ahead and append it. See, it's appending one on here, right? So if you look at results, the list, it has a three in it, then it put in a one. So I'm going to go a little bit faster. Hopefully you get the idea how this is working here. As I continue to go over here and create an instance, put it in the list by appending it, I'm generating the list and it should go all the way to 10. See how I'm, I'm, I've got three, one, three, three, four. Keep on going. Where am I? I'm almost there, guys. This helps you see the flow of control and understand what's going on here. So we're in this loop and we're, uh, you know, uh, generating an interest, I mean, generating an instance, putting it in the variable result, and then appending result to the results list. So as you can, you can see, Another, that's probably one of the, uh, the latter ones being, uh, let's see how many we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This, this, that's going to be it. We're going to be getting out of this loop and then we're going to be going on to the next line of code. And I'm going to stop there, right? So we're going to get a printout here. It's going to say 10 rolls of six sided dies. And then we're going to print results, which is the list that was populated. So we, on line 17, we create an empty list and then we iterate through the list. We create these instances and we append those instances to the list. See, it's gonna print right there. And there it is right there. See, 10 rolls of six sides gives us three, one, three, three, four, et cetera. And now it's gonna go ahead and do the rest of the program. And I'm gonna just stop right here because it's really the same idea. And now he's gonna, we're gonna go ahead and do this for a 10 sided die. And the other one is for a 20 sided die. And the, the, the structure, the, the internal loop, it's the same structure. It's the same looping idea. So basically you, you create the code one time and you just copy and paste it. Okay. So that's the first one on here. Let's go ahead and look at uh, the, um, the next, uh, try it yourself. So it says make a list of, make a list or tuple containing a series of 10 numbers and five letters. Randomly select four numbers or letters from the list and print a message saying that any ticket matching these four numbers or letters will win a prize. Okay. So let's look at the logic on this first and then we'll, we'll, we'll let's step into it in just a minute. So we, the first thing we do is at, at the top is we have our import statement for choice because we're going to be as you have in the guide, we're going to be choosing from this list. So on line three, I have a list. This list has the numbers one through 10 and A, B, C, D, E. Then I have another list. And this other list is an empty list called the winning tickets, the winning ticket. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in the loop here. And I'm going to go ahead and generate a, a winning ticket. So I'm going to loop four times to generate, I'm, I was going to say four numbers or four possibilities, because it could either be a number or a letter, right? Or all numbers or all letters, because it's going to be chosen at random, right? It's going to be, we're going to choose at random. That's what, what, that's what the choice function does. It's going to choose at random one of these things inside this list. It could either be a letter or, or a number or really anything on here, okay? But what we want to do is we're going to add some extra logic on line 15 um, 
to make sure that it doesn't repeat. So we'll say if pulled item not in the winning list. Of course, when you first start off, the winning list is empty. So if I choose the number one and I generate another uh, choice and it ends up choosing one again, it's not gonna add it to the list if it's already in the list. If you wanna test it without the if, you can just get rid of this if statement and of course change the indentation so that it's um, you know in line with the, uh, the logic of, uh, on here. I put in a breakpoint here on line five so that we can uh, follow the logic on this. So I'm gonna to go to run, start debugging, Python file. And it stops on winning ticket. It, it, it went ahead and populated pop, uh, the, the list pop of uh, possibilities is created. Uh, as you can see here in variables, I can go ahead and see that the uh, possibilities already has this content, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and press F11. And of course, a uh, winning ticket is empty here. So this, uh, this allows, this window here allows me to watch the local variables. I can see that winning ticket doesn't have anything in it. Then I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's see what the winning ticket is. Of course, now I have to generate it. Now it says, let's see what the winning ticket is in the output, right? So now I'm gonna go ahead and go through a loop and I'm gonna say while length of winning ticket is less than four. So let's go through this and let's see, this is what's gonna happen. So it's gonna go ahead and, and choose one for possibilities, put it in pulled item. Then it's gonna to check to see if it's not repeated. If it's not repeated, it's gonna say we pulled it. So it, this will fire, right? But if it doesn't, then it'll loop and go through again. Okay, it won't append it if it's there. If, if I pull, if I have one and I generate again and I got another one, it's not going to go and append the one because the if will not fire, right? And it will oh, it will repeat as long as winning ticket is is less than four. So really, what we're doing is we're going zero, one, two, three, which gives us four, right? So let me continue to do the F11 on here. And we're gonna see this populate here. So we, we, we got an eight. And of course the first one on there is fine because there was ne nothing there before. So we go through this again and we've got another one here. Pulled item is six. So is six not in there? No, it's not. So it, it goes through it. Let's go ahead and do another one, another pulled one. And the pulled one is two. We haven't had any repeat yet, but then we, we'll see what happens. So it goes and gets C this time, right? Well, of course, C is not there before, so it, it fires. And then we're gonna go ahead and do another one here. Did I press the wrong button? Oh, it already went to four. Okay, so it finished. So basically we didn't get a chance to see it, but if you run this again, and again and again, because you know we just got lucky, 862C, um, you know, it would continue, it, you would see it, the if not fire, if it was um, in there, okay? All right, let's go to the next one. The next one is really drawn out. I don't think, um, I'm not sure whether I'm gonna go ahead and do a, um, a step through on this one. Let me just go ahead and go over it with you. Lottery analysis, so you can use a loop to see how hard it might be to win the kind of lottery you just model. Make a list uh, or a tuple called my ticket. Write a loop to keep pulling numbers until your ticket wins. Print a message reporting how many times the, uh, the loop had to run to give you a winning ticket. Yeah, you don't wanna be, you definitely don't wanna do the step into, well, what you could do is probably make this easier um, so that you could do that. Uh, but uh, basically what you have is you've got, um, well, first of all, you gotta have the import statement. You gotta import choice. You've got one definition called, uh, 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 one method definition called get winning ticket. It receives possibilities and it goes through a loop here and um, it generates 
um, it gets a winning ticket, right? And it returns the winning ticket. Then it makes a random ticket down over here. And then in the middle, it checks. So you pass it the play ticket and the winning ticket. So that happens over here. So in line 44, we have our possibilities. I call generate the winning ticket. So really the logic starts here, guys, on line 44. I just wanted to show you what those, those methods were. You could have put those methods in a module and then called them with the dot operator, right? So that you wouldn't have too much uh, in here. You could have just had, you could start it right here on line 44. So I go ahead and call get winning ticket and the winning ticket is returned right in here. Then I set place to zero and one to false. And I let the maximum number of tries, I set it to uh, 1 million. So while not one, I go ahead and uh, call the make random ticket, right? That's my ticket, right? And then I'm gonna go ahead and call the check ticket method which passes the new ticket that's like you say that's let's pretend that's the one i'm holding in my hand and of course i want to match that up with the winning ticket which i generated before on line 45 and what i'm going to do is i'm going to be incrementing plays this is a, a, a an accumulator here or an incrementer it's going to be incrementing by one and then i'm going to say if plays is once it reach 1 million, hopefully it will go that far, it's just going to break. It's going to stop, right? But if you do win, you know, so in other words, um, you know, uh, if you call check ticket, it's going to return one, which is either true or false, right? Let's go ahead and see that. Yeah, it's, it's going to return true, right? Or true or false, right? So it's going to go ahead and return a Boolean. If it's a, a, it returns true, it is a winning ticket. They match, in other words, right? Um, so that is that is what check ticket does for for element in play tickets. If element not in winning ticket, return false. Otherwise, uh, return true. So of course we start off with false, and this continues to go through here, and. So when we get to 60, we'll say, if true, if true, then we'll go ahead and say, we have a winning ticket. Your ticket is, and then the winning ticket is, uh, it only took X number of tries. Else, then that would be the false situation. Uh, then you would say, um, you tried X number of times without pulling a winning ticket. Uh, your ticket was, and the winning ticket was. Of course, you'd never get here if you ended up going to one, uh, 1 million, right? Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. So as you can see here, the, the your, my ticket, and I'm gonna pretend that's my ticket, is 174E. The winning ticket is 74E1. Uh, and of course they match, but you know, they're not in the exact order. This is not that kind of, you know, they have to just be in any order. We'd have to do other logic to go ahead and do that. It only took 1,279 1, tries to go ahead and win. All right, so that's the author showing off that he's got a good math background. None of you know this, um, your, the author of your book has a degree in physics. He started graduate school in physics and then um, stopped and then became an elementary school teacher in Alaska. And that's who wrote your book. And he teaches um, people, young youngsters, how to program in uh, Python, right? So that is the end of the Try It Yourselves. So let's go ahead and then finish this up. If you go to my uh, lecture notes, we'll talk about styling classes. So a few styling uh, issues uh, we need to go ahead and talk about that are important. Now he uses the word camel case. And I think I've mentioned this in other videos. I don't agree with this. Um, I think he mentioned it on his website. 
I think he means Pascal case for, for a class, right? So you know how when you create a class, you start it with a capital letter, and if, if the class has two words, then the second word should be capitalized. You know, like electric car. Remember how we did electric car? We had a capital E and a capital C, okay? That's not camel case. To me, that's called Pascal case. Camel case looks like a real camel. A camel case is when you start with the lowercase letter and then the, the second word would then be capitalized. So you go ahead and look it up. Now I did give you a little uh, link here to see for yourself what is the difference. You know, on here, so if you click on this little link here, it'll take you to what is the difference between Pascal case and camel case. And um, see, camel case looks like this. It starts with a, like, like, you know, with a lowercase letter and the middle one would then be capitalized. So this would, you know, um, this is camel uh, uh, case, right? Pascal case, uh, you know, capitalizes the first character of each word, right? So, uh, there are other kinds of cases. There's, uh, it's not discussed in here, but there's also something called um, snake case, which is one word, all lowercase, and then an underscore, and then another word. And I'm not really sure, but it could be possible that snake case is kind of maybe used in um, a lot in, in Python, and maybe they call it snake case because that's the kind of style that we see a lot in Python. I don't know. I'll need to do a little bit more investigation uh, on this. So every class should have a doc string, just like every method or function should have a doc string, right? So a doc string, you know, that's the three double quotes to create a doc string. And if he shows us how to create the doc strings, he doesn't show us how to use them. I think I mentioned it somewhere in one of my videos, how you can go ahead and print out all the, and it's, it's a form of documentation so that you can understand the logic uh, of your program. So he also talks about the importance of using blank lines to organize your code. I'm a firm believer of this, but you don't want to do it excessively. This, you know, when you first learn your program, you just want to find that just right. Now, when I get code from students and I see, like, I look at the top, go all the way to the bottom, there's not even one blank line. It's, you know what, it's hard to read. You want to have a blank line be between the different sections of, of code. Uh, one of the things that's re reminded, uh, he says here, is that within a class, you can use one blank line between methods. And within a module, you can use two blank lines to separate classes. I forget that one, though, the two blank line things, you know? But I'm, all, I'm pretty good about putting in a blank line. And then if you need to import the module from a standard library and a module that you can that you wrote, place the import statement for the standard module first. Then add a blank line and the import statement for the module that you wrote. And these are conventions, right? When he talks about style, style is a convention. Remember, a convention is just something that, you know, as Python programmers, this is the way that we have agreed to write our code. So in programs with multiple import statement statements, this convention makes it easier to see where the different modules are uh, modules use, different to see the different modules used in the program or to see where they come from. So now that brings us to the summary of the whole chapter. Let's try and bring it all together here. This was a really good chapter, one of the best ones I've seen. Now I know it doesn't go into to a lot of stuff in detail. If you were to get one of those you know, one of those big old fat books on programming that are like, you know, like seven inches um, thick, you'll have like entire chapters on inheritance and polymorphism and abstraction. And so it just goes on and on and on. He just went ahead and gave you just enough to get started, okay? So in this chapter, you learn how to write your own classes. You learned how to store information in a class using attributes. So the idea here is that the information or the data is that's attributes, and how to write methods that give you that give your classes the behavior they need. They need so methods are are, are, are uh, so behaviors are represented by methods. 
you learn to write an init method that creates instances for your classes with exactly the attributes that you want. So when you instantiate an object, right? When you, when you create an instance of the object, at that point in time, the flow of control is going to go to the init method. In other languages, like for example, if you're coming from a Java language, some people refer to this as a constructor. We don't call it a constructor here in Python, it, it because it doesn't it doesn't fit, you know, the full uh, definition uh, of what the constructor does. But it's similar. It initializes. That's why it's called an init method. So you saw how to modify the attributes of an instance directly. That's when you do the assignment statement or through a method. Now, when you go through a method, you know, I think of, you know, uh, encapsulization in, in Java. I also think of the fact that that would mean private data, public methods. We can simulate that in Python, but remember guys, every, all it's all public. Uh, so anybody can go ahead and access the attributes directly or through a method. I, I still write my code um, so that attributes are accessed through methods. And that's probably more meaningful for those of you that have uh, a, a little Java background on here. You also learned that inheritance can simplify the creation of classes um, that are related to each other. You, you know that you're an advanced user when you say that it's been simplified, right? For a beginner, they're saying, what? You know, uh, but uh, hopefully it did seem simple. When you inherit a class, you just mentioned the name of the class in the parenthesis, you, you specify the parent. So it's pretty easy stuff. Uh, looking back on it, I hope you can see it that way. You learn how to use instances of one class as attributes in another class to keep each class simple. You saw how storing classes in modules and importing classes that you need in files where where they're used can help your projects be better organized. You started to learn about the Python you know, uh, standard library. And I think we talked about the standard library and other chapters uh, you know, as well, but I think you went into it a little bit more here. You saw an example of the random module and we ended up looking at, inside the random module, we looked at two methods. We looked at random int, method and we looked at the choice uh, method. Remember the choice method selects an element from a list and the random int generates a pseudo random number, not suitable for you know, security related uh, projects, but a good simulation for you know, pseudo randomness. So finally, you learned uh, how to style your classes using Python conventions. Uh, so what are you going to learn in the next chapter? It's just getting it's getting more interesting every um, chapter as we move along. In the next chapter, chapter 10, you'll learn to work with files so that you can save the work that you've done in a program uh, and work uh, you've uh, allowed users to do. So in other words, uh, what we've ever what we've done before has not included any kind of persistence, right? That means that you run the program and you can't access the data again. So let's say you generate a list of friends. Once you've generated the list of friends, it's, you know, it's not been stored anywhere, right? So we're going to learn how to do things like generate a list of friends, store it in a data file, right? In a, a tech, in this case, it's tech, a text file. Later on, you'll graduate. That text file will end up being a database file, right? So what you want to do is then you open up the database file you know, and you add more friends or you take away friends or delete friends, right? Of course, it would be friends. It'd be, you know, it could be like an employee database. So you go like step by step by step. First, you start talking about storing the data in a text file, and then you graduate to, you know, um, database files. So you'll also learn in that chapter about exceptions, uh, a special Python class designed to help you respond to errors when they arise. Now, there's all kinds of exceptions, you know. Um, exceptions at, with reference to files would be something like this. When you, let's say you want to try and open up a file, but the file doesn't exist. Well, you're going to get a, an error message. So that's a very uh, hard way to, 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 to end your program. So what you want to do is you want to be able to catch that exception, right? 
and maybe give the user some kind of dialogue telling them what they got to do to uh, um, to fix the situation or at least give them some kind of feedback as to what happened and uh, maybe who to contact or you know any kind of feedback uh, at all so that is the summary of of this chapter on on um, you know an introduction to object-oriented programming we covered classes we covered inheritance we covered the um, you know the Python standard uh, library where we can use uh, program defined uh, functions. We also talked about how we can cut up all of our classes and put them in little files called modules and then we can then import them into our main program. And that's a little bit more professional. It's a little bit it's a better way of creating modularity. That's why they're called modules baby right modularity and what where we're really going with this idea is with the concept of code reuse. And that has to do with the idea in an object-oriented program. And once we create a class and it's a clean class and it's a simple class, we can then use it again, right? By simply instantiating an object and using the functions to um, you know, accomplish our objectives. So that's all I got to say today. Uh, you know, guys, this is uh, uh, Professor Benavides over and out.